So Ian, Ian was uh, was one of the key you know, you know, uh, inventor of the uh, generative adversarial network, and uh, he is also one of the, the first people to discover the adversarial examples. So let's just welcome Ian to give us a talk. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm going to be talking about adversarial robustness and how it relates to AI safety. Uh, the fact that we already have an adversarial machine learning session here at the workshop shows that I'm preaching to the choir for at least some of you, but I expect that some of you don't know why there's an adversarial machine learning session at this workshop, and this talk will hopefully help you understand that better. Uh, for those of you who already believe there's a connection, uh, I hope that I might give you a few more arguments that you can use to persuade people that this is an important topic. And maybe I'll tell you about a connection you didn't already know about between adversarial robustness and AI safety. Um, the main purpose of this talk is I would like to convince all of you that adversarial robustness is a research area that you can all work on today to make measurable progress toward both short-term and long-term AI safety issues. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, an adversarial example is an input to a machine learning model that is intentionally designed to make the machine learning model make a mistake. Uh, the kind that's most often studied, but by no means the only kind, is this type of image where you make a very small change to the image, and the model then produces the wrong answer. Uh, so the classic example that gets copied to a lot of uh, papers is one for a paper I wrote a few years ago where we started with a picture of a panda. We add the image in the middle of the slide, scale down quite a lot, to get the image on the right. Um, it's a very tiny change, uh, and the result is no longer classified as a panda, it's now classified as a gibbon. Uh, one important thing to understand about this is that the image in the middle looks like noise to the human eye. It's not actually noise, it looks like noise to us because our, our eyes tend to think that high frequency signals are random. Uh, it's actually carefully calculated noise designed to fool specifically a neural net into making the wrong decision. There are several different kinds of adversarial examples. There's a lot of ways of categorizing them. One way is we can think about whether the adversarial example is a white box or a black box adversarial example. Um, white box adversarial examples are made with knowledge of the model. Black box model adversarial examples are made without the knowledge of the model. There's all kinds of shades of gray in between. For example, you might have an attacker who can send inputs to the model and get outputs on the model but don't know its parameters. You can have attackers that know or don't know which learning algorithm is being used, that know or don't know which architecture of neural net is being used, that kind of thing. There's a lot of different levels of access to the model. But adversarial examples are feasible even with no access whatsoever to the model. Another important thing to understand about adversarial examples is that they can be either targeted or untargeted. An untargeted adversarial example is just trying to cause a mistake. So we have a picture of a panda. It counts as a mistake if we say it's a gibbon. It counts as a mistake if we say it's an airplane. It counts as a mistake if we say it's a cat. A targeted adversarial example is when the adversary has a specific mistake in, in mind. So they want specifically to make the defending model think that the input is a gibbon. Um, the adversary only wins in the targeted case if they actually make the model think that it's a given. If they make it think it's a cat, that doesn't really count as a win for the attacker, even though it might be a loss for the defender. Uh, it turns out you can make really fine-grained targeted attacks. Uh, you can make speech recognition systems output entire sentences of the attacker's choosing. You can make reinforcement learning algorithms uh, go into a state of the attacker's choosing. So this isn't just something that affects classifiers, it affects complicated models like sequence models, generative models, reinforcement learning policies. It's a pretty widespread problem where the attacker has a lot of flexibility in what kind of goals they can achieve. So that's what adversarial examples are. Uh, now let's start to get into AI safety. Uh, throughout the day, you've probably seen that a lot of people have different things in mind when they talk about AI safety. I actually prepared this slide with two different kinds of safety in mind. I think people have actually brought up even more kinds than I anticipated throughout the course of today's workshop. Um, one of these is what I'm gonna call short-term safety which is where we have a situation that's otherwise safe and it becomes dangerous when we have AI do the work for us because the AI might make a dumb mistake. Um, this is, uh, or, or, sorry, uh, this is, I got it backwards. It's short-term safety is when there's a situation that's normally dangerous and you need something highly competent uh, to carry out the work or it's dangerous. So an example is air traffic control. Uh, if you have a highly competent trained person doing air traffic control, 
uh, airplanes are safe. If you have a child doing air traffic control, they'll make a mistake and maybe cause the planes to crash. Um, so that's short-term AI safety, where our concern is whether the AI is competent enough. There's also long-term AI safety, uh, where we're going to use AI in an otherwise safe context, but we're worried about what extremely powerful AI might do that we don't intend. This is the kind of thing where you want to be careful about what sort of wish you make when you have a genie, or a monkey's paw, where maybe we'll do exactly what you said, but you get uh, what you said and not what you meant. And the classic example there is the paper clipping scenario, where people talk about uh, what if you have a very powerful agent designed to maximize the number of paper clips in the world and it turns literally everything into paper clips. So I'm actually going to argue that we can address uh, both of these kinds of safety by studying adversarial robustness. Not that just getting adversarial robustness will be sufficient to solve both, but that it's important for both. Um, so some common arguments that I bet some of you get against studying AI safety, especially the long-term version. Uh, the first argument that's really common is that advanced AI is so far away that we don't know what it looks like at all, and we can't actually study it. Uh, so I'm actually going to argue that adversarial robustness can be studied today on currently existing machine learning algorithms, and whatever we learn there is likely going to be applicable to long-term AI safety. Uh, whatever we build in the future, we'll probably have some of the modern machine learning systems as at least subroutines of the eventual system that we build. And we need to make sure that those components are robust. Uh, so why am I saying that adversarial robustness is really related to adversarial safety? One reason is that uh, adversarial robustness is looking at the worst case for what happens when a machine learning system actually encounters an attacker who's trying to minimize uh, the reward that the, that, that the system is able to achieve. Um, if we can guarantee good performance in the worst case, it means that we're also going to get even better performance than that in the average case. So if you can guarantee that even when the attacker is trying to make something dangerous happen, you don't get the dangerous thing, we know that we won't get the dangerous thing in the course of normal operation. This is a pretty standard way of doing engineering throughout lots of different kinds of systems. We've also seen it specifically in computer science before. Um, I work at Google, the reason that Google works is that we have uh, distributed systems engineering where we're able to have many different machines cooperate to send messages over the network and implement things like distributed file systems. That all works because of things like Byzantine fault tolerance. Uh, if you've never heard of Byzantine fault tolerance, it's uh, an idea for how to make different computers cooperate when you assume that one of them, or more than one possibly, but a small number of them, is actually controlled by a malicious adversary. So a lot of the algorithms for having computers coordinate over a network are actually designed with the assumption that some of the computers are actually intentionally crashing or sending wrong packets in order to interfere with the whole system. That's not actually what's happening in a data center. The data center is actually experiencing random crashes and random incorrect packets being over sent over the network. But if you can guarantee that even if there were an adversary controlling some of these machines, you'll get good results, then you get good results in practice as well. So I think we should bring that engineering practice to AI, and adversarial robustness is the way that we actually formalize it for many kinds of machine learning problems. Um, another reason that I think adversarial robustness is related to AI safety is that we can think of adversarial robustness as developing a set of analytics techniques. When you run an adversarial example construction algorithm, you're essentially asking the system under which circumstances would the system do some specific undesirable thing? Uh, for example, under which circumstances would it say that a panda is a given? Um, making an adversarial example allows us to identify a specific case where the undesirable behavior happens. Uh, and another important part of adversarial robustness literature is actually developing verification methods that can prove that no adversarial examples exist in certain circumstances. Those can essentially be thought of as verification and analysis techniques that guarantee that the dangerous behavior does not happen in certain circumstances. Another reason that uh, adversarial robustness is related to AI safety is that targeted adversarial examples can give the adversary very fine-grained and flexible control over what a system does. Uh, I mentioned the example earlier that a speech recognition system that outputs a sentence can be made to output essentially any sentence. Or an RL agent can be made to go into almost any state by an adversary making adversarial examples observed by the agent. Uh, that means that the attacker can essentially control the system. And one way that we can very easily get a dangerous system, we build a system that is otherwise safe, 
but then it comes under control of a malicious adversary. Uh, I also think that this scenario deserves particular attention because uh, the malicious adversary actually has an incentive to make this scenario occur. Some of the other scenarios that we worry about in AI safety research are scenarios that we think will occur because the incentives to avoid them are not strong enough. But in a lot of cases, like paper clipping, nobody has an incentive to intentionally make a paper clipping agent. Uh, we worry that people don't have strong enough incentives to figure out how to prevent paper clipping before we build a powerful agent, but nobody actually wants that scenario to happen. Um, in cases where a malicious adversary could take control of a powerful AI, the adversary has a strong motive to actually do that. Um, one interesting thought about the fact that um, a dangerous AI can come from control by a malicious adversary is that this also suggests we should study traditional cybersecurity and program verification. We don't want to build a powerful AI and then have it get compromised by something like a buffer overrun attack that gives the attacker you know, root access on the machine that generates the agent's reward function. Um, Another reason that I think adversarial robustness should be very interesting to AI safety researchers is that the adversarial example techniques that we use to actually make the adversarial examples look exactly like reward maximizers. So for the plot where I showed you changing the panda to a given, we're essentially writing down a givenness function, uh, which is just p of class <laughs> equals given, given input, um, and we start maximizing the givenness function. And then as you move into input space, we move from uh, a picture that's a panda to another picture that we as humans still think is a panda, but is now recognized as being a given. Um, we can think of these kinds of adversarial examples for uh, classifiers as a sort of uh, drosophila, the, the fruit fly of, of incorrect reward maximization. It makes it really easy to study these kinds of mistakes without having to set up all the machinery of a long-term learning reinforcement learning agent. And if we can't solve it here, it seems hard to imagine that we'd solve it in a more complicated system. So this seems like a good place to start. Um, in particular, sometimes you'll hear people criticizing the model of norm-constrained adversarial examples, where uh, the adversarial example is made by adding a small change to some starting point. There are a lot of valid criticisms of that model. It isn't really a model that describes a real-world security scenario. But I think for the reward-maximizing research crowd, it's interesting because the kinds of adversarial examples you see there are the kinds of mistakes you see in the first few steps of reward maximization. So each of these plots here is showing a sequence of steps of gradient ascent on the probability of the airplane class given the input. We are not actually doing anything at all to tell the gradient ascent algorithm that it should make a mistake. We're just telling it to maximize airplaneness. And after about five steps of gradient ascent on this image of a ship, we've got an image of a ship that the model now thinks is an airplane. Um, same here with the cat, it takes six steps, or the, the truck, it takes eight steps to be an airplane. But in all these cases, uh, the low norm adversarial perturbations are showing you just exactly what you get when you start trying to maximize one of these functions. Um, also, another reason that I think we should care about adversarial robustness for AI safety is that many proposals for safety are based on estimating either human preferences. So you have a module that inspects what your agent is going to do and says, uh, would a human like this? Yes, no. Uh, or you have a module that says, is this action safe? Yes, no. Uh, I'll, I'll refer to this as the, the safety module uh, class of proposals. If you propose a safety module and your safety module is vulnerable to adversarial examples, then a reward maximizer is going to make adversarial examples in the inner loop. Uh, the reward maximizer is looking for actions that will be approved by the safety module and then will go on to get high reward in the world. Uh, if the safety module has adversarial examples, the reward maximizer has an incentive to find them. Um, so if you want to learn human preferences or you want to learn whether actions are safe, you've got to do so in an adversarially robust way. Um, Many proposals for uh, AI safety also involve using finely calibrated confidence estimates. Uh, I, I have an example of one paper that, that I included here, which is about how to make a robot that respects its off button uh, that involves carefully calibrated confidence estimates of whether the robot understands better than the human what is good for the human. Um, those kinds of theorems are nice, but they only work if the agent actually does have good confidence estimates in the real world. 
Adversarial examples illustrate that in many of the cases that would arise when we start running a reward maximizer, we actually don't have good confidence estimates. So let's look back at the panda example. The original panda is classified as a panda with 57.7% uh, probability, according to the model that's a panda. After we make the adversarial perturbation of the image, and it's classified as a given, it's classified with 99.3% confidence that it's a given. So it's not that we're just barely wandering over the decision boundary. Uh, the attacker is actually able to make the model have higher confidence in the mistakes that it has in the correct actions. Um, we really need to fix this if we're going to do safety proposals that depend on confidence estimates. And a lot of the time, you can run studies where you use IIE data, and you find that your confidence estimates are pretty good. Uh, the adversarial analysis technique helps you to find the flaws in your confidence estimates much more quickly. Uh, so those are all the arguments, uh, those, those are all the reasons I think adversarial robustness is uh, an actionable way to study AI safety in the short term. I'm now moving on to another argument that people give against studying long-term AI safety, uh, which is that there are existing problems in the short term, and they outweigh the, the potential risks of long-term AI safety problems. One argument I'm providing against that is uh, that you can actually find compatibility between short-term and long-term concerns. There's a lot of things you can do to prepare for the long-term that are also good in the short-term. And one of those things is adversarial robustness. Those other topics too, I'm here to sell you adversarial robustness, so that's what I'll focus on. Um, so when you try to estimate what does a human actually want, I mentioned earlier the idea of having a, a human preferences model that will try to guess what the human really means. Um, that's actually a short-term issue as well as a long-term issue. And it's not just a safety issue, it's just something that you need to make your products work. Uh, your products interact with humans, they've got to understand humans. So just working on understanding humans better is good for long-term safety, but also good for just selling a product today. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this is Siri used to have a bug that if you said, can you call me an ambulance, Siri would say, all right, from now on, I'll call you an ambulance. <laughs> this is fixed now, don't try it, or you really will get an ambulance called for you. Uh, but it just illustrates how, yeah, if you want people to use something, it's gotta understand what they want. Uh, another short-term thing that people would like to put in all kinds of products is what I call model-based optimization. This is where you make a machine learning model that looks at inputs and then predicts some quality of the output. Like here, for example, you might have a blueprint for a car and you predict how fast the car is going to go. You can then start optimizing the input to this predictor in order to maximize its output. So you can train on a few real car designs you've seen in real life and then start maximizing for better and better car designs, get really fast cars. Um, this is the kind of thing we would like to do to make uh, better chips that run faster or use less energy or make DNA sequences that code for proteins that bind strongly to certain receptors to make effective medicines. Uh, all kinds of different things that you could do with model-based optimization if it worked. It does work in some low-dimensional or simple settings, but if you use this in high-dimensional complicated settings, you don't actually get a really fast car. You get a blueprint that the model thinks is going to be a really fast car. Uh, so if you work on short-term machine learning capabilities and figure out a way to make model-based optimization actually give you something good, rather than an adversarial example, that's also connected to long-term safety issues. Um, and then one final argument against uh, studying long-term AI safety is that it's hard to quantify and measure progress because it's also far in the future or because anything you do would only have counterfactual impact. Uh, adversarial robustness gives us one angle that we can actually measure. It's hard to measure for technical reasons. It's relatively straightforward to specify what we want. Uh, it can be hard to prove that no adversary can fool a machine learning model in a specific setting, but we can actually get lower and upper bounds uh, on the error rate. We can use verification methods to get uh, lower bounds on the error rate. Or, or sorry, we can use actual attacks to get lower bounds on the actual error rate. We can get um, verification methods to get upper bounds on the error rate. Those are both hard to do. When you use the attacks, it's hard to make sure that they're strong enough that you're getting a tight bound. When you use verification methods, it's hard to make anything that comes up with a proof at all. And a lot of the time, the assumptions you make for the proof are unrealistic, so it makes relatively pessimistic bounds. But they're both research areas where you can dig in and actually start measuring things. Or you can work on the actual defense mechanisms themselves and measure them with the techniques that people already have. So it's actually quantifiable, measurable, actionable. Um, 
If you'd like to dig in and start working on any of this today, one easy way to get involved is to check out the adversarial example library that my colleagues and I maintain. It's called Clever Hans. Uh, it's named in honor of a horse named Clever Hans uh, who was trained to do arithmetic. Um, you know, surprise, surprise, he didn't actually learn to do arithmetic. He just learned to maximize a, an Apple-based reward signal in order to give the appearance of understanding arithmetic. So we're hoping this library will help point out the ways that our machine learning models uh, are actually faking their abilities in the same way that Clever Hans the horse did. Uh, and I'm now available for questions. Well, thank you very much for this great talk. Uh, you mentioned this in your last slide that measuring the lower bound is not really uh, accurate because it's essentially a binary classification whether given a certain perturbation level it is possible to uh, craft an adversarial example or not. Is there, has there been any progress in coming up with actual lower bounds? There, there are real lower bounds. Um, I guess what I'm saying is that it's difficult and the bounds are loose, uh, but there are valid lower bounds. What do you mean they're valid? Uh, in, in the sense that for the specified threat model, they actually provide a proof that no attack algorithm can uh, can do more damage than they tell you they'd be able to do. Uh, they're, they're based on, all the existing verification methods that I'm aware of are based on geometry. You essentially say, I assume that the attacker can send input points in this region, and then the verification method uses something like an LP or an SDP to uh, prove that there's no point inside that space that actually results in changing the outcome class. Uh, thanks so much for the time. I think it's a great talk. First of all, I want to say it's really, really great to hear people talking about the fact that there is no inherent contradiction between long-term and short-term AI research. I think it's really unfortunate that, that that idea has just become amplified in a lot of journalistic coverage of these topics, just because I think there's so much synergy to be found between the two areas. Um, I guess one thing your uh, talk I hadn't really thought a lot about adversarial like robustness as a kind of AI safety roadmap. But I was thinking in the context of the previous conversation um, a few talks ago about um, uh, training data and actually having standards for those. Uh, this makes me wonder also another argument for the value of having kind of full-time data curation teams, which is that there's just so much that can be explored in the context of a robust uh, training data set. And I wonder if having people kind of just whacking the hell out of it uh, can actually be like a very practical and kind of exploratory data analysis way of studying how to sale robustness in any practical context. Yeah, um, there's some interesting work on the connection between training sets and adversarial robustness. Um, you might have seen a paper called uh, Adversarial Training Requires More Data, uh, where, where they construct examples where you can prove that um, the adversarial vulnerabilities come from uh, generalization error rather than from other problems you might imagine, like the model family or underfitting. And you know, that we now think that, they, that some of them could go away given enough data. Uh, we don't know exactly how much data is required for each task, and this might be one of those statements that's true but not useful. Like, if you need a quintillion examples, then um, maybe it's better to find a more data efficient method rather than to gather more data. But yeah, there, there is interesting research going on in the connection between your actual training sets and the adversarial robustness properties of your class of pair at the end of the day. Can you say the name of that paper again? I think it's called Adversarial Training Requires More Data, or it might be called Adversarial Robustness Requires More Data. I don't remember the exact title. Yeah, we as humans get pit in our stomach sometimes when the salesman is doing something weird or we, we've got an unease. Are you aware of any work or any progress on detecting whether a result is actually adversarial or not? You get, you get your confidence, but also confidence in adversariality. Um, so are you saying, there's two issues you might be asking about. One is, can a machine learning model look at its input and decide whether that's an adversarial example? And the other one is, uh, we as humans look at something a machine learning model did and we're actually not sure you know, like we're confident that the model is wrong, but maybe it's maybe it's us that has the bug. Maybe the first, but both are interesting. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so for the first, there have been a lot of attempts to detect adversarial examples. As far as I know, all of them have been broken. Uh, there's a paper called uh, "Adversarial Examples Are Not Easily Detected" by my <coughs> colleague Nicholas Carlini, where he just went and broke like ten published methods, uh, and I can say the most common flaw is that people will often uh, collect like a training set of adversarial examples that they made at full sum model, 
and then they make a detector that can detect those adversarial examples. <laughs> what they don't do is go back and see if they can then fool the detector with, with a new round of adversarial examples. Uh, there, there's some other pitfalls, like detection is really, really hard. Uh, I've tried to write detector papers several times. Uh, one thing that's frustrating in this field is a lot of the time you'll try something, you'll figure out it doesn't work, and then somebody else will write a paper claiming it does work, and then you like email Nicholas and ask him to break it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it's, it's a direction that I think could possibly work. Uh, I, one, one wrinkle I would say is it's a lot easier to just shut off when you think you might get a wrong answer than to try to decide whether the input is specifically an adversarial example. Uh, so if you just shut off for almost everything and then think that real data is only a little tiny fraction of the space, that's something I think has a slight chance of working. Uh, I had a paper rejected from iClear where I showed I could get this to work on MNIST but not on CIFAR. Um, just sort of put it out there as like a trail of breadcrumbs leading in a direction that I think could eventually work. Um, if you just look at like the iClear reviews, you'll see my rejected paper, and that's the one I'm talking about. So I think I think um, shutting off when you're not confident you'll get the right answer is possibly feasible. Saying specifically that the input is an adversarial example is really really hard. So I I was wondering whether you know you could go back on on your remark on non based uh, adversarial robustness. And uh, and uh, whether you if you share with us your thoughts on uh, as to whether you know we we should be taking you know the several robustness in the general setting that, that you put forward, or maybe we should be thinking more uh, yeah, more broadly on transformations, for example. And what are your thoughts about you know different approaches in that respect? Taking it for granted that this is particularly suitable with learning and and you know gradient descent, of course. Yeah, yeah. So I would say the adversarial example literature is a huge mess these days because so many people are talking about it with different interests in mind. And uh, people tend to assume that everyone else has the same interests as them and then get upset when some of the papers don't make any sense coming from their background. So I would say if you're interested in things like making model-based optimization work, uh, or if you want a really easy toy problem for machine learning security, then norm-based adversarial examples are a reasonable thing to study. If you want to study uh, real machine learning security, Norm-based adversarial examples make no sense whatsoever. And so a lot of people who are concerned about real security and don't want just a toy task or don't want something related to the model-based optimization problem get really confused about why so many people are writing about the normal thing. Um, if you're interested in real-world security for things like images, you can look at what does like YouTube spam look like, for example. Uh, so there's, there's some countries where people want to upload porn to YouTube. Uh, because you know, porn sites are otherwise blocked in those countries. In the US, people mostly don't upload porn to YouTube because there's other porn sites for it. And the kinds of things that they do there are, are, are like, um, well, there's, there's been a lot of research on this after Tumblr just open sourced their porn detector, and people can do things like add pictures of a cartoon owl because it pushes up on the safe for workness of the image. And, and so you put lots of like cute cartoon things it outweighs the porn, and it gets, that doesn't look like anything like a, like a normal-based adversarial perturbation. But, but it is something that's practical to do in the real world, and it's easy for someone who doesn't even necessarily have a big in-depth understanding of gradient descent and so on to figure out my work. Right. Thank you. Last question? So just a, sorry, uh, just a quick one there. Um, so given that we, we base our testing on the principle that um, we, can, we can't show the absence of errors, we can only confirm that errors exist. How far do you think this, this part of the field has got into us understanding how much we know and, and not how much we don't know, if that makes sense? So, so as, as a, in a safety environment, if we put all the techniques together, w would we have some kind of a, a robust system? No. There's, there's nothing that would work in the real world. Uh, there's, there's things that work on like easy research benchmarks. Uh, so, so like adversarial training, it gets you to like 50% error rate on the CPAR 10 data set. Um, that error rate is already too high to actually want to use it in any kind of real setting where the errors would cause real harm. And then the other thing is that's based on an unrealistic threat model where the attacker is designed to be limited to make the research project easy. Uh, we actually don't really have anything that would work on an attacker who wasn't limited artificially. Uh, so it's really, really early days of the field. Um, and I guess as a researcher, that's exciting. Uh, as somebody who wants to build a safe system, it's scary. Uh, <laughs> but but you know, we've really only been working on this problem seriously for a few years. Uh, until a few years ago, if you said, 
hey, look, this machine learning system made a mistake, people would say, well, that's not news. Machine learning always makes mistakes. Uh, now that it works on IID data, uh, for the last few years, people have suddenly become interested in making sure it works when it comes under attack. And given that it's only been a few years, we're not very far along, but I also think I'm optimistic that we'll get a lot further as we have more time to put into it. So if we have everybody's okay and Ian is fine, we have uh, the last three question. Oh, okay for yeah. Because we, we see a lot of questions here. <laughs> okay, um, I was just curious about your thoughts, how you characterize the connection between this uh, kind of the safety direction of research and also the kind of you know, robustness performance improvement, specifically around um, using kind of adversarial hard example mining uh, to sort of improve the capabilities of networks. Yeah, um, so it's funny because there's reasons that there should be compatibility between those goals, and then in practice we actually see more of a trade-off between them. Um, th there was a big paper, uh, a, a paper about a, like a, a big study where they ran hundreds of models through adversarial robustness tests, and they confirmed a thing that people had seen uh, in, in a less controlled way, which is that there tends to be a trade-off between accuracy on clean data and accuracy on adversarial examples. So we don't have a great understanding of why that is yet, even to the extent of like, is it underfitting or, or overfitting in a weird way. Um, you could imagine making like a perfect classifier that just gets both the clean and the adversarial examples correct, but when we generalize to a test set, that doesn't actually seem to be what we're, we're seeing in practice. One of the first papers I wrote on this topic, I got, for a brief moment, the state of the art on non-convolutional MNIST by using adversarial training, and I thought that was how everything was gonna go from then on. But that was kind of like the, the one time that it happened. Uh, the other case where we actually do see improvements from adversarial training is if you don't have very much labeled data for the, the classifier. There's a technique called virtual adversarial training, where you take a much larger unlabeled data set and you train the model to make the same prediction on unlabeled examples, whether or not an adversary is corrupting them. Um, that's actually one of the best semi-supervised learning techniques. So when you have limited labeled data, this adversarial stuff seems to be good for capabilities as well as security. Otherwise, it's really only relevant for security. And another thing I've noticed while working on this from the security angle, which is actually kind of different from the long-term AI safety angle, is that there's a lot of things you could do that are completely orthogonal to the quality of the classifier. So if you think the quality of the classifier is measured by uh, how often does it get the right answer on test data, uh, there's a lot of things you could do that would improve security without improving or harming uh, classifier accuracy. So if you make um, <coughs> mistakes that are harder for an attacker to find, or if you make the classifier uh, stochastic or, or dynamic so it doesn't repeat the same mistake over and over again, uh, those are both things that improve its security but don't necessarily have any effect on its uh, accuracy on test data. So uh, what's the difference you see between uh, adversarial uh, susceptibility uh, and overfitting or high variance of the model? Uh, do you see that very different or do you see similar? Uh, so one thing that I know is a little bit different about them is that uh, a lot of the time models that tend to underfit and not overfit at all are very bad in terms of adversarial robustness. One example is linear classifiers. Uh, they are some of the easiest things to pull and some of the hardest things to harden. Uh, you're basically guaranteed that if you have something like softmax regression, if the attacker pushes the input in the direction of the weights for class I, the output will be from class I. So they're really easy to pull. There isn't much you can do to harden against them. Uh, some data sets, happen to be nicely linearly separable, such that all points near the training data can actually be correctly classified by the classifier. That's more of like the data set cooperating with you rather than the, the model overcame the problem. And, and the last question? Um, she's in charge of her. What do you agree that um, one possible um, advantage of the research on adverse robustness for long-term AI safety is that we think about that one we will have um, architectures where we have to base deep learning models, for instance, as sensors, and then if we have a set that we have found uh, planning or reasoning layers on top of it, and if you attack the sensors with simple adverse examples, then you're able to compromise the whole model. Yeah, I, I think that completely makes sense. Um, there's a, a paper by Sarah Sabor called Adversarial Manipulation of Deep Representations which is kind of like what you're talking about. Uh, it's not the far future yet, so it, it, she can't literally do what you're asking about, but 
Um, most adversarial examples are based on fooling a classifier. Uh, her paper is about fooling a feature extractor. Uh, so given an image of, I think she has like a, a picture of a flamingo, and she modifies it so that when you extract the features, they're the same as the features you get if you ran it on a specific photo of a truck. So if you take one of the um, activation maximization techniques to take the features and decode them and figure out what input the model was looking at when it extracted those features, you actually get the flamingo. Uh, or so you actually get the truck, even though it was looking at the flamingo. Um, I might have gotten that backwards in the wrong categories, but yeah, basically people have demonstrated the same qualitative kind of attack that you're talking about. Okay, let's thank Ian.